Hey, welcome to another video. So today we're going to be looking at psychoanalysis. So this video is going to be in two parts and we're going to start off by looking at Freudian psychoanalysis. Psychoanalysis is known as the talking cure as it attempts to provide treatment for those with psychological distress. By being able to talk freely, therapists are then able to provide insights into the thoughts of the patient. There are different types of psychoanalysis. The main proponent of it is Sigmund Freud. His way of examining people's internal thoughts was then developed by a range of other psychoanalysis such as Jacques Lacan, who we'll be looking at in part two. The field has moved beyond just clinical practice, however, and is now used to think through ideas around art, society, and culture. So when Freud started out, he looked at what he called hysteric patients. Those were individuals who had acute nervous conditions and pain. By listening to them talk, he was able to figure out why they had their conditions and often related them back to childhood and sexual experiences. By uncovering the foundational causes, Freud argued that the traumatic conditions felt by an individual could then be worked through, thereby eliminating the ailment. Freud argued that people were led instinctively or unconsciously by desires. These made them act in certain ways driven by their former experiences. The unconscious mind is part of the mind that holds these unknown thoughts and experiences, thus creating those desires and forcing the person to behave in certain ways. A child may have had a bad experience with a snake as a baby. They don't remember this as an adult, but they may now have an irrational fear of snakes which they can't explain. It also might cause them to behave in certain ways that might not seem directly related. For example, they might not like handbags because the texture reminds their unconscious mind of snake. They can't explain or even be fully aware of their dislike for handbags, but it still exists. What Freudian analysis might do is link this further back to repressed memories, finding a way that a person's ego may behave in ways that are deemed more socially permissible. So the patient may be afraid of handbags, but when they talk about them might actually show a sense of illicit excitement. This is a relationship between a repressed desire being expressed and the way in which one's ego may allow it to be expressed. Other symptoms might be things like Freudian slip, when someone says something they supposedly don't mean to say. Freud argued that these demonstrate what the unconscious mind is really thinking. Ever heard the phrase that every joke has some truth in it? It's the same idea. Freud also argued that dreams can be read to work out the desires of the unconscious mind that have been masked by the absurdity of the dream. That's the work of the ego. All of these examples show what the ego represses, but also demonstrates that the repressed always finds a way to escape. Freud also argued that human sexuality is not inherently programmed. Instead, everyone has a libido or sexual energy that seeks out satisfaction. The way it does this is based on the individual background of that person. One of the most famous ideas that Freud spoke about is the Oedipus complex. Based on the Greek myth, this argues that every child sexually desires a parent and wishes to kill the competitor for affection, usually the other parent. It's worth remembering that Freud didn't just mean sexual attraction in the way we might I understand it. He used the idea of sexuality to think about the emotional pleasure one receives in having a bond with another person. If a child desires their primary caregiver, this usually means they wish to have an emotional bond that is uninterrupted by the attentions of another, usually the caregiver's partner who might distract attention away from the child. The desire of the unconscious mind is to remove that distraction, thus killing the other person eliminates the threat. This all takes place in the imaginary mind, so it doesn't mean a child is going to kill anyone. However, the effects of such a desire may cause a person to function in particular ways. Another idea that Freud's hypothesis raises is the idea of castration. It's worth remembering as well, this is a highly debated idea, and Freud's ideas are not without their critics. The idea of castration goes that the young boy child, wanting to take possession of the mother, realizes that girls do not have penises. The threat now becomes that the father will similarly castrate the boy, removing his power. Thus, the boy has to cease the desire for his mother and instead assume the role of the father. To fully resolve the complex, the boy seeks another love object. In doing so, the boy now takes on the role of the father and has a healthy attachment to another female love object. Well, what about girls though? Well, Freud says something similar happens, but critics argue that in his formulation, girls already being castrated therefore wouldn't have a reason to detach from the love object of the mother and therefore didn't face the same supposed threat as boys. This has never really been responded to by proponents of Freudian psychoanalysis, including Freud himself. 
Obviously, Freud also relies on binary ways of thinking about sex and gender, and his ideas are formulated around traditional ideas of the family. However, the ideas he speaks about are useful to look at the way characters behave in cultural texts. Freud applied psychoanalytical readings to Shakespearean texts, as they often are full of characters who kill their father or their mother's lover, in ways he argued were demonstrative of the Oedipus complex. However, critics also argue this is viewed as being too reductive and can make different different texts all the same. Psychoanalytic criticism also needs to look at the way a reader engages with the text and the relationship between the two. So we might think about how and why a reader or viewer identifies with a character, as well as the reasons the character behaves in certain ways. We can identify with the good person, the hero, but also the bad one, the villain, at any given time, and both in positive and negative ways. Psychoanalysis helps us to understand this. Why, for instance, might we root for a character like Walter White? There are processes of identification and disidentification that take place throughout Breaking Bad, but the show also works to play around with how we do this, forcing us to question our morality as well as the different characters in the show. So in the next part, we'll look at some Lacanian psychoanalysis and how this has been developed to look at villains and Hitchcock films, among other things. Okay, that's it for this week. Remember to tune in next time for the second part of how to read psychoanalysis remember to like, comment and subscribe and ring the bell for notifications. I'll see you next time.